Welcome, everyone, whether online or in person. We're grateful that you are here. It's the 11th uh, weekend of the Pentecost. And tonight, uh, our theme, and today, our theme is Mercy Matters. Mercy Matters. We'll begin with the prelude. We sing Lamb of God. Jesus Christ cleanses me from sin. 
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. God of all peoples, your arms reach out to embrace all those who call upon you. Teach us as disciples of your Son to love the world with compassion and constancy, that your name may be known throughout the earth. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Lord. Amen. Amen. The first reading today is from Isaiah 56. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right. For soon my salvation will come and my deliverance will be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it, and hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them 
besides these already gathered. Psalm for tonight is Psalm and today, Psalm 67. Let the people praise you, O God. Let every people praise you. May God's face upon us shine and be gracious to us all. Let the saving power and ways of God be known throughout the earth. Let the people Praise you, O oh God. Let every people praise you. Let the nation sing for joy, and let everyone be glad. For in fairness do you judge and guide the nations of the world. Let the people praise you. O oh God, let every people praise you. From the bounty of the earth came the blessing of our God, so that all the ends of earth may know the mighty deeds of God. Let the people praise you, O oh God. Let every people praise you. The second reading is from Romans, the 11th chapter. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, I myself I am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. Our gospel verse, healer of our every ill. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 15th chapter. Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when, you heard, when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into the pit. And Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, 
murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Kyrie eleison, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise Praise to you, you, O Christ. Christ. Well, two little parables today, and I'm not sure if I wanted, uh, I thought maybe if Jesus stopped at the first one, I would understand it. When people say bad words and hurtful things, don't go by them. Just kind of let them be. But then he goes to the next parable, and he talks about a woman, a Canaanite woman from that place, one that was not always well-liked. So now... Jesus said, we should embrace her. And Jesus does after her persistent persistence. So today, I was thinking about order, things in order. And I know you're going back to school pretty soon. And I was thinking when I used to teach math, I used to like to have things in order. So... I would start with number one and two and number three, four and five, six, and the magic number seven. So everything is in order. And and I can I can look at it and I like that order. And when I teach children how to begin counting, that's what I would do. We'd go in order. But then as they grew up a little bit and they understood the different numbers, we had something called a fact family. And so I could take the number seven and I could put three and I could put four together, and they would make seven, but they're different. Or I could make five, and I can make, make sure I get my math right here, and I can make two, and I can make seven. So I kind of mix them up, and sometimes we don't like to mix up the order. It's easier when it just goes in a line, and it goes smooth. This is a hard concept to grasp sometimes, and I get it. And today, Jesus kind of mixes things up. He mixes up the order, and he puts all of these in different places, and they all add up to one thing. We are all different, and sometimes we get all messed up, and we keep coming back And we keep saying, help, have mercy on us, O Lord. Kyrie eleison. We are all different, and we all add up to one love, God's love. Amen. Amen.
One morning uh, this past week, an incredible young man and from our congregation and I went from a white went for a bike ride early in the morning. Uh, the ride led to conversation of all kinds, a conversation about what it means to uh, grow up, leave home, and discover home again. Now, in the conversation, you realize he's riding along with me, so, you know, this is the way it works. In the conversation, I referenced the work of Richard Rohr, who recently in his meditations have has been speaking about this universal pattern that is the journey of life and the universal pattern that is faith itself. And it's sort of related to what uh, Paula was talking about. It's the pattern of order, disorder, and reorder. Growing up, maturing, often involves going through that pattern. Leaving home, which is what our conversation was about, is often a matter of ordering, disordering, and reordering. Life in God, call it salvation or growth in love, frequently follows the same pattern. Let's begin by talking about order, first of all. It's an essential part of the beginning of life, an essential part of the beginning of faith. As most of you know, children need order. They need a sense of home. They need a sense of belonging. They need clear stories and clear direction that help them define life and their place in it. They need boundaries, and without them, they often falter. Without what Rohr calls a good container, they often struggle with themselves as life evolves. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want you to think that children and human beings in general aren't resilient, that they cannot overcome bad upbringing. They can, and many do, but order is a great place to start in life. And it's true in religion, by the way, and I really struggle with those, and they are legion these days, who say they don't want to force any kind of religion on their kids or make them come to church. They want them to choose for themselves. But if they are not exposed to something, if they are not provided a tradition and rituals and consistent stories and expectations for behavior, how can they choose? What are they choosing from? Kids need a solid container. They need some kind of order that tradition can bring them. We all do. I am eternally grateful for the stability that my family provided me. I rather like the Lutheranism that they exposed me to and indoctrinated me with. I'm glad that I learned my lessons well, that I know how to defend the worldview that is my container. Now, you get a sense from the Bible that Jesus was given a strong container. He was a Jew a learned one, a rabbi, Matthew would have, have us know, he, without a doubt, knew where he came from. I suspect that he learned his lessons well. He knew the commandments, the ones that were written down and the ones that were passed on through oral tradition. In the Gospel of Matthew, he is so entrenched in that tradition, in his own people, in what we would call home, that when a foreign woman comes to him on behalf of her daughter who was possessed by a demon, he won't talk to her. She is not a part of the club. She's not part of the club at all. And what is, but she's got a problem. And so she says, Kyrie eleison. By the way, if you don't know what that term means, it's time for you to learn. Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy. And she says, Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy on me, son of David. That is, she's calling him a true Jew. He knows, she knows who he is. But Matthew tells us that he did not answer her at all. He did not 
answer her at all. Jesus had a good container. He knew who he was. He knew what it meant to be a good Jew. And good Jews don't talk to women in public. Good Jews especially don't talk to foreign women who represent the arch enemy of Israel, the Canaanites. It's very interesting that Matthew uses that term Canaanite. If you, if you read the Gospel of Mark, Mark uses a Syrophoenician, uh, but Matthew uses the term Canaanite. The Canaanites didn't exist at the time of Matthew. Matthew is trying to tell you that this woman represents the arch, a, arch enemy, the ancient arch enemy of the people of God, the Canaanites. One of the things that a good container, well-defined boundaries, stability, a deep and lasting commitment to one's own religion does is to create a world of us and them. It's normal, by the way. You often don't know who you are if you don't know who you're not. When I was growing up, I knew that I wasn't Catholic. Or, in Cincinnati, I knew that I wasn't from Kentucky. Frankly, I am not sure I really knew what it meant to be Lutheran or to be from Cincinnati, but we certainly knew, well, we weren't Kentuckians and we weren't Catholics. Now, one of the realities that accompanies this kind of order is what we could call purity. In a very ordered world, we develop strict notions about what it means to be who we are. To be Lutheran, and of course this came through the lens of my mom, to be Lutheran meant we did not play bingo or go to church festivals. And while we drank, we didn't drink too much. Purity is common for religion in the first stage. And it's all right, by the way. It's good. Purity often represents first stage of life thinking. And frankly, it's probably helpful for children. It serves them well to know you just don't do that. It serves them well to know that you do do this, but you don't do that. Now, Jesus had learned the purity tradition of his religion. But to be honest with you, as you read the Gospels, you see that he seemed not to be overly fond of that tradition. Or at least, at least he wanted to transform it. Uh-oh, now we're moving into disorder. In Matthew today, he's struggling with the tradition that has come to him through what we call the oral law. That is the interpretation of the religion by the teachers of religion. And in this case, those teachers were the Pharisees. And these folks taught about clean and unclean foods. They also taught about the significance of the ceremonial washing of hands. They focused on those purity rituals. And by the way, this is one that's still worth your while doing. All right, wash your hands. All right, these days, worth your while, wash your hands. But you have to understand, ancient people didn't wash their hands to get rid of germs. They didn't know about germs. When they washed their hands, they, in this case, did so for purity rituals that made it quite clear who they were vis-a-vis -vis other people. They knew who they weren't, and they knew who they were. They were Jews, and Jews don't eat ham sandwiches. We are Catholic, and we don't eat meat and Lent. But Jesus takes on these purity rituals and disorders people's lives. Listen and understand, he says. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of a mouth that defiles. And uh, note this, the, the disciples, when he said that, came to him and said, Do you not know that you have offended the Pharisees with what you said? 
Jesus doesn't care. He's strong enough. He's had a strong enough container to take on the religious leaders, to unsettle them and unsettle us. Ceremonial, ritual purity. They, he believes, are not as significant as the weightier matters. Really bad stuff comes from really bad insides not from eating the wrong kinds of food or from not washing your hands in some kind of elaborate ritual ceremony. Now, this teaching threw people into great disorder. You got to get this. To follow Jesus is to become disordered. And in our reading for today, in this marvelous story, Jesus himself experiences that disordering. He has to deal with what he was taught or how he viewed himself in light of what he was taught. So not only does Jesus disorder, he himself is also disordered. After he refuses to answer the Canaanite woman, he tells his disciples, listen, I was sent only to the lost house of the sheep of Israel. In other words, my mission is narrow. She is an intrusion. Jesus remains in the first stage, the order stage. But this pugnacious woman, this pugnacious foreign woman takes him on and she says, Lord, help me. And then, and you should be bothered by what he says next, he responds with a prejudicial comment. He says, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Dog is an ethnic slur for Gentiles. Gentiles are considered less than fully human. But the woman knows better. And besides, she is a mom who is like a dog on a bone. Her daughter is sick, and Jesus can help. And his prejudice against her is not going to stop her. And she responds with one of the best lines in all of the Bible, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. You may need to dismiss me for who I am as a Canaanite, but you have what I want, and I am not going to stop at your prejudice. And then, converted, Jesus says, Woman, great is your faith. Nowhere else, by the way, in the Gospel of Matthew does Jesus ever say that anybody's faith is great. This foreign Canaanite woman is said to have great faith. Many times in Matthew, the disciples are said to be people of little faith. This foreigner, this Canaanite woman, has great faith. And Jesus now is forever changed. His mission now in the Gospel of Matthew will include the Gentiles. So much so that at the end of this great book, He will speak to his disciples, and you know what he will say to them? Go to all the nations. The word for nations is Gentiles. Go to all the Gentiles. The mystery, excuse me, the ministry of the church includes the whole world. Order now has gone through disorder to discover a new order, a new reordering. Yes? It often starts at home. And home, not always, by the way, but many times can be a very good place. Without a doubt, order is a good thing. But life with Jesus is going to disorder your life. It will not allow you to be content simply with where you came from. It will take you away from home. And it won't let you be satisfied with keeping anybody out the foreigners, or the hometown folks. By the way, for Paul today, the struggle is with the hometown folks. And in Romans today, he concludes 
that God will not write off the hometown folks. God will not write off his people, the Jews, even though they have not fully received Jesus. God doesn't write anybody off. God is the God of the nations, the God of the world, the God of the Gentiles. And as the psalmist says today, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the nations praise you. That kind of God unsettles our small, little gods, the gods of our groups, the gods of our tribes. That God disorders our lives. But truthfully, to be discovered by that God is to discover a reordering of our lives that takes us to our true home. And in that home, we all find a place. We all find rest. In God, we all sit down at the table of mercy and grace. And yes, that's a new place, but man, is it good. Amen. We uh, sing a song that uh, puts this gospel reading that we just heard and heard preached about to music. Some uh, announcements before we turn to prayer. Special welcome to uh, to those of you who are joining us uh, via Facebook Live or YouTube. If there is a way for you to communicate to us that you are watching, we would be most grateful. This pastor is really grateful to know that that there's still connection with our people. The longer this goes on, the, the more I feel disconnected. So it's really Great to see people here tonight, and great to know that you are watching online. Uh, Please keep bringing your offering envelopes in or sending them via mail or bringing them uh, to uh, worship on Saturday night or Sunday morning. And please know, for those who have gathered here tonight, there are baskets to take your envelopes. We are uh, sponsoring a kayaking event coming up. On, and it's meant for everybody. You don't have to be young. You can be any age. And we're going to do it on Friday, August the 28th at Duck Lake State Park. And be, meet there at 6.30, which may be a possibility to be out there when we get closer to a sunset. So August the 28th, Friday, 6.30. Uh, we are encouraging as many of you as possible to be connected to a small group in some way. 
Uh, we have those that uh, small groups that are online. We have small groups that are meeting here at church. And we're looking for you to create new small groups. And people are doing that right now, and we are grateful. Please think about participating in one. We want to make sure that our people remain connected to one another and to our faith community. Let's turn our hearts and our minds to prayer. Let us pray. Surrounded by the presence of God, let us pray with persistent love for the whole church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for the precious gift of life and for the blessing of still gathering, regardless of time, space, or widespread disease. Gather up those who, for a multitude of reasons, have not yet come to know there is ample room at the table of grace and empower us to live into the abundance of your love in spite of our own misgivings. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God of creation, as we begin to see the harvest bring forth its abundance of colors and a multitude of vegetables and fruit, let us be ever mindful of those who search for food and experience hunger every day. Show mercy to every species of animal as floods, fires, and dwindling habitats challenge their existence. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Merciful Lord, our hearts ache when the voices and visions of violence overshadow the cries for justice and peace. We pray for all nations in conflict, especially the United States at this time of upheaval and division. We pray for your grace to settle in the hearts of all who govern. Usher us into a new place where different is never a reason to dismiss or degrade one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God of renewal, as children of God, we are called to live into our baptism in all phases of our lives. Meet us in that sacred space which opens us up to the newness of your grace and mercy each day. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Jesus, healer of our every ill, we pray for all who are suffering from physical ailments, emotional turmoil, and spiritual adversity. We pray for hungry children, fearful parents, grieving loved ones. We pray for those in abusive relationships, addictive patterns of thinking, and dementia. We especially lift up today Eileen Horton, Bev Bringadall, Linda Clark, Betty Catlin, Tara Pearson, Alan Langlois, Jenny Zaleski, Annette Jack, and Dan Barushko. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Everlasting Father, we give you thanks for those who have gone before us and whose steadfast faith continues to live within us. Grant comfort and compassion to the family and friends of Jan Glick and Becca or Judy Williams. May they sense the peace of your presence today and throughout the days ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting only in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our delight, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed are you coming here to your church. 
night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples to eat, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after the supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this. For the remembrance of me. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the body of Christ, broken for you and for me. The blood of Christ is shed for you and for me. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our final song, All Things New. Come true and do you hear?
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Stay in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.